Hello and welcome to this installment of COVID-19 What Pharmacists Know Now series brought to you by the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists BC Branch. My name is Ivy Chow and I am a clinical pharmacy specialist in antimicrobial stewardship with the Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services here in British Columbia. I'm also a clinical instructor with the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of British Columbia. On January 17th, Health Canada authorized Paxlovid Canada's first oral antiviral treatment for mild to moderate COVID-19 in adult patients not requiring hospitalization and who are at high risk of progressing to serious illness. The purpose of today's presentation is to give you an overview of Paxlovid in the treatment of COVID-19. Just before we begin the presentation, I would like to provide some disclosures and disclaimers. I have no conflicts, biases, or relevant financial relationships to declare. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic is rapidly evolving with ongoing research and publication of information as we speak. So the information presented is based on the best available evidence as of January 31st, 2022. And the views of this presentation are my own and do not reflect those of Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists BC branch. By the end of the presentation, you'll be able to describe the mechanism of Paxlovid and the potential role in the treatment of COVID-19 infection as well as to be able to evaluate the clinical evidence for Paxlovid in the treatment of COVID-19, to provide dosing recommendations of Paxlovid in special patient population, and to describe the safety profile and significant drug interactions associated with Paxlovid. Paxlovid is a combination of two oral protease inhibitors, nirmatrivir and ritonavir. Many know the drug ritonavir through the years of experience in the treatment of HIV, and nirmatrivir, also known earlier as PF, 07321332 is a new proteus inhibitor with select activity against SARS-CoV-2. To understand the mechanism of Paxlovid, we must first understand the viral replication of SARS-CoV-2. As depicted in this visual, SARS-CoV-2 attachment to host cell occurs via the ACE2 receptor, leading to membrane fusion and endocytosis. Next comes encoding and translation of viral genetic material that encodes instruction to create more viruses. Creation of more copy of the viral instruction is done through the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Simultaneous proteolysis occurs whereby proteases cut viral protein into functional pieces required for viral replication. Finally, assembly and exocytosis of the virus occurs, allowing them to infect other cells. The proteolysis step is where Paxlovid's activity exists to disrupt the viral replication process. As seen in the previous slide, Paxlovid works at the proteolysis stage of viral replication. Nirmaltrovir disrupts the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 by inhibiting the main protease or 3C-like protease, a virally encoded enzyme that plays a critical role in the SARS-CoV-2 replication cycle. Ritonavir, an HIV-1 protease inhibitor, has no activity against SARS-CoV-2 and purely acts as a pharmaco enhancer or boosting agent by slowing the metabolism of nirmaltrovir through the inhibition of the CYP3A4 mediated metabolism of nirmaltrovir, resulting in increased plasma concentrations of nirmaltrovir. The table in this slide shows the pharmacokinetic properties of nirmaltrovir and ritonavir. Some key important pharmacokinetic properties of Paxlovid to note is the half-life is roughly around six hours. Nirmaltrovir is renally eliminated, which is important to note as renal adjustment will require in patients with renal impairment. As for the metabolic pathway, both nirmaltrovir and ritonavir are CYP3A4 substrates, meaning there are significant drug interactions to be aware of, and this will be discussed later in this presentation. The clinical trials looking at Paxlovid as part of the evaluation of protease inhibition for COVID-19 EPIC Phase 2-3 development program. There are three key clinical trials in this program, which include EPIC-HR, EPIC-SR, and EPIC-PEP. EPIC HR looks at evaluating Paxlovid in high risk patients, EPIC SR looks at evaluating Paxlovid in standard risk patients, and EPIC PEP looks at evaluating Paxlovid in post exposure prophylaxis. Let's now evaluate the available presented results of the EPIC HR study. This trial was stopped early at 75% enrollment of the planned 3,000 participants due to efficacy demonstrated in preliminary results. At the end, 2,246 participants were included in the final analysis. The design of the study was a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, multicenter study that included participants greater than or equal to 18 years of age 
and vaccinated with no prior history of COVID-19 infection, not requiring hospitalization with laboratory confirmed diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection with symptom onset of less than or equal to five days plus one or more risk factor for progressing to severe disease. The excluded participants who are pregnant, breastfeeding, those with severe liver disease, those with severe renal impairment or requiring dialysis, known uncontrolled HIV, or on any drugs that are highly dependent on CYP3A4 for clearance, or strong inducers of CYP3A4. Just to note, a more comprehensive inclusion exclusion criteria can be found in the study protocol listed on the clinicaltrials.gov website. The intervention was nirmatrivir 300 mg plus ritonavir 100 mg every 12 hours for five consecutive days compared to placebo. The primary efficacy outcome looked at proportion of patients with COVID-19 related hospitalization or death from any cause through to day 28. The secondary outcome looked at incidence of adverse events, duration and severity of COVID-19 symptoms, all-cause mortality, number of COVID-19 related medical visits, not including hospitalization, and number of days in hospital and ICU for the treatment of COVID-19. The results of the EPIC HR trial has not been peer-reviewed or even published, and the only available data is what has been submitted to Health Canada and available through Pfizer's press releases. What we can gather from the results so far is the baseline characteristics or balance between the two groups. Mean age was 45 years old, 52% male, 63% Caucasian, 63% had symptom onset less than or equal to three days. One interesting point to note was one of the criteria for inclusion was no prior COVID-19 infection. However, 56% of the patients are actually had a positive serologic result at baseline. It would be interesting to see what results of this subgroup to determine the magnitude of packs of it on hospitalization rate in patients with prior COVID-19 infection or those who have received the COVID-19 vaccine. The primary outcome was the likelihood of hospitalization due to COVID-19 or death from any cause within 28 days. What is presented in this table is non-hospitalized patients within five days of symptom onset who did not receive monoclonal antibiotic treatment at baseline. From these numbers, Paxlovid reduced the risk of hospitalization by 88% compared to placebo in patients treated within five days of symptom onset. When looking at an absolute risk reduction, it was roughly 5.6% yielding a number needed to treat of 18. All-cause mortality through day 28 was zero in the Paxlovid group compared to 12 patients in the placebo group. Of note, most patients in this trial were infected with the Delta variant, roughly 98%, so its efficacy with the Omicron variant is largely unknown. What we know from the in vitro studies is that Paxlovid retains activity against the variant Omicron, which is the predominant circulant variant in Canada at the moment. From the real-world data with the Omicron variant, hospitalization risk appears lower than Delta, so the extent of benefit of Paxlovid may be dampened. For secondary outcomes, Treatment emergent adverse events were similar between Paxlovid and placebo and were mostly mild in intensity. Discontinuation of drug due to adverse events were also comparable between the two groups. Moving on to the EPIC-SR study, the difference between the EPIC-HR study and the EPIC-SR study was the EPIC-SR study looked at standard risk patients who were at low risk for hospitalization or death. The study design was relatively similar except that in the EPIC-SR study, they included unvaccinated participants who were at standard risk or vaccinated participants with one or more risk factor for progressing to severe illness. Exclusion criteria was the same. Intervention and comparator was the same. Outcomes were similar except the primary outcome was the time to sustain alleviation of all targeted COVID-19 signs and symptoms through to day 28. Similar to the EPIC-HR study, results of the interim analysis of the EPIC-SR study has not been peer-reviewed and the information presented was gathered from Pfizer's press release. At the time of the reported interim analysis, baseline characteristics were not available, and for the primary endpoint of cells reported, sustained alleviation of all signs and symptoms of COVID-19 as compared to placebo was not met. The key efficacy outcome of COVID-19-related hospitalization through day 28 and all-cause mortality showed only a 70% reduction in hospitalization and no death in the treated population for any cause compared to placebo. This was a smaller reduction than what was seen in the EPIC-HR study. When we broke it down at the interim analysis, which included 45% of the trial's planned enrollment, 0.6% of those who received Paxlovid were hospitalized, compared to 2.4% of patient group who received placebo. No death has occurred in either group. A follow-up analysis at 80% of enrolled patients was consistent with the prior finding. Safety outcomes 
were also comparable between placebo and Paxlovid. Based on the totality of the data available, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee recommended that this trial continue, so we will have to wait for the final results of the study to determine the effects of Paxlovid on standard risk patients who are at low risk for hospitalization and death due to COVID-19. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the post-exposure study as the trial is still ongoing and no available data has been reported. The design is a randomized, double-blinded, double-dummy, placebo-controlled, multi-center study with an estimated enrollment of 2,634 participants. The regimen used for post-exposure prophylaxis is looking at either Paxlovid for 5 days or Paxlovid for 10 days post-exposure of symptomatic household contacts compared to placebo. It will be interesting to see what the impact Paxlovid might have on post-exposure prophylaxis of COVID-19. Given what we know so far from the clinical evidence of Paxlovid and also the high incidence of COVID-19 cases with the highly transmissible Omicron variant, we do face some challenges. Paxlovid works at preventing viral replication and therefore needs to be taken early in the course of COVID-19 infection. Currently is recommended to be initiated within five days of symptom onset. The other challenge is currently our testing capacity is limited and not everyone is getting tested. However, we do need to confirm patients are COVID-19 positive before initiating Paxlovid, ideally via PCR or rapid antigen tests. Another limitation is although the Canadian government has purchased 1 million treatment courses of Paxlovid from Pfizer, the distribution of this medication to each province will be a stepwise approach, with a limited supply initially and ramping up as more supply becomes available. Therefore, with these limitations, we need to prioritize patients that will most likely benefit from Paxlovid, and when more supply arrives in Canada, the criteria will be expanded. During the initial short supply of Paxlovid, Canada has put out some interim recommendations aiming to assist provinces and territories in their planning for deployment of the initial supply based on clinical risk factors and health equity considerations. What they suggest is to prioritize individuals with the highest risk for severe illness and hospitalization, and these high-risk individual groups include moderate to severe immunocompromised not expected to mount an adequate response to SARS-CoV-2 infection regardless of COVID-19 vaccination status, individuals who are greater than or equal to 80 years old whose COVID-19 vaccination is not up to date, and those individuals greater than or equal to 60 years old residing in underserved rural or remote communities, residing in long-term care settings, or those living in or from First Nations, Inuit, Metis communities whose COVID-19 vaccination are not up to date. However, each province and health can further adopt its own criteria as to who will be eligible for Paxlovid. Keeping in mind, recommendations may change or will be revised based on publication of peer-reviewed data and also when more supply of Paxlovid becomes available. Given Paxlovid is an oral antiviral intended to be used in an outpatient basis, the screening of patients and dispensing will be mainly at an outpatient or community level. Some provinces have tapped into the centralized intake process with the HealthLink 811 to screen for eligibility. Once a patient meets criteria for Paxlovid, medications will be dispensed via select pharmacies. For those eligible patients, the dose of Paxlovid is nemaltrevir 300 mg and ritonavir 100 mg taken together orally with or without food twice daily for a total of five days. Should a patient require hospitalization due to severe COVID-19 infection, after starting treatment with Paxlovid, it is recommended that patients still complete the full five days of treatment course while in hospital, but this will be dependent on the healthcare professional's discretion. As mentioned earlier, nermaltrevir is renally eliminated and therefore will require dose adjustments in patients with renal impairment. Individuals with moderate renal impairment and EGFR between 30 to 59 mils per minute, the dose of nermaltrevir is reduced by 50%. Those with severe renal impairment and EGFR less than 30 mils per minute, Paxlovid is contraindicated. As Paxlovid trials excluded patients with severe liver disease, we don't have information on the use of Paxlovid in this patient population, and therefore Paxlovid is contraindicated in patients with severe hepatic impairment or a child pew classification C. There are no available human data on the use of nermaltrevir during pregnancy to evaluate for a drug-associated risk of major birth defects, miscarriages, or adverse maternal or fetal outcomes. There are also no data present for women who are breastfeeding. 
Also, the safety and efficacy of Paxlovid has not been established in pediatric population as the trials included owner participants greater than or equal to 18 years of age. Because nirmatrovir is co-administered with ritonavir, there may be a risk of HIV developing resistance to HIV protease inhibitors in individuals with uncontrolled or undiagnosed HIV-1, and the recommendations are not to start Paxlovid in this patient population. According to clinical trials of Paxlovid, adverse effects were generally mild. Reported adverse effects include headache, taste disturbance, high blood pressure, diarrhea, vomiting, and myalgias. Paxlovid has significant and complex drug-drug interactions, primarily due to the ritonavir component of this combination. The product monograph of Paxlovid contains a long list of contraindications and potential drug-drug interactions. Drug-drug interactions leading to potential serious and or life-threatening reactions are possible due to the effects of ritonavir on the hepatic metabolism of certain drugs. Paxlovid is contraindicated with drugs that are highly dependent on CYP3A4 for clearance, and elevated concentrations of these medications are associated with serious or life-threatening reactions. In this slide, I have listed some potential medications that should not be co-administered with Paxlovid. This is not an exhaustive list, but notable medications include antiarrhythmics such as amiodarone, antipsychotics such as clozapine, ergot derivatives such as ergonamine, PDE5 inhibitors such as sildenafil or tadalafil used for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension, endothelial receptor antagonists such as bosentin, and anti-cancer agents such as neuratinib. In the previous slide, we talked about drug-drug interactions leading to potential serious and or life-threatening reactions that are possible due to the effects of ritonavir on the hepatic metabolism of certain drugs. In the slide, we discuss drug-drug interactions where Paxlovid concentrations are reduced. As you recall, both nemaltrevir and ritonavir are CYP3A4 substrates, and the drugs that are a potent CYP3A4 inducer can reduce Paxlovid concentration, leading to potential loss of virological response for efficacy and potential for resistant development. In this slide, I have listed some potential medications that should not be co-administered with Paxlovid due to the prolonged enzyme-inducing effects of these medications, this being current or recent use in the past 28 days. This is not an exhaustive list, but notable medications include anti-cancer agents such as avalutamide, anticonvulsants such as carbamazepine, phenobarbital, phenytoin, antimicrobials such as rifampin, and herbal products such as St. John's wort. The COVID-19 advisory for Ontario developed a very nice chart depicting some of the potential drug-drug interactions with Paxlovid, and also provided some recommendations in the management of these drug-drug interactions. CYP3A4 inhibition by ritonavir typically resolves within three to five days after discontinuing the drug. Depending on the drug-drug interaction and the clinical significance, some of these medications may be potentially withheld or be able to switch to alternatives while on Paxlovid treatment. I'd like to refer you to a useful resource for interaction checks with COVID-19 therapy through the University of Liverpool COVID-19 Interaction Checker. Paxlovid is available in Blistapax, like the image shown in this slide. What is important to note is for patients where we need to dose reduce nirmaltrevir, such as renal impairment, the dispensing pharmacy must remove one tablet of nirmaltrevir from the morning and one from the evening blister, and then affix stickers from the manufacturer noting the change in dose and the removal of tablet. Although the Canadian government has not divulged how much is paying for Paxlovid, Pfizer indicated that the U.S. bought its initial supply for $530 U.S. dollar for treatment course. I expect this to be roughly the same for Canada. For comparison, the mean cost of COVID-19 hospitalization is roughly around $22,000. A recently published McGill University study suggests paying such steep prices for certain COVID-19 treatment may still be cost-effective. Presented here is the cost analysis for packs of it. In this analysis, they combine the trial results of the EPIC-HR and the EPIC-SR to calculate their number needed to treat. So when we look at a 2.5% risk of hospitalization, the number needed to treat is 48. However, when we look at higher risk of hospitalization, the number needed to treat becomes smaller, confirming patients with the highest likelihood of hospitalization will have the greatest benefit from Paxlovid. Looking at the cost per hospitalization prevented, Paxlovid becomes cost effective when risk of hospitalization is at least 5% or higher. Most COVID trials have been conducted before the identification of Omicron, which carries a much lower risk of hospitalization. In BC, the average hospitalization rate for Omicron is approximately 1.2%. So if a patient has a 1.2% risk of hospitalization, therapies such as Paxlovid would decrease their absolute risk very minimally, 
and unlikely to be cost effective. But if we look at the highest risk patient group with the highest risk of hospitalization in the range of 15 to 25 percent, we would expect a more significant absolute risk reduction and a cost benefit. I hope in this presentation I was able to provide you with a quick overview of Paxivir, the first oral antiviral agent authorized in the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in Canada. The main uncertainty associated with Paxivir is related to its limited available clinical efficacy and safety evidence at this time. We need to wait for the final published peer review results of the EPIC-HR and EPIC-SR studies before we determine the impact of Paxivir in the treatment of COVID-19. Based on the current evidence and the limited supplies of Paxivir, we need to prioritize individuals with the greatest risk who may benefit the most. Drug-drug interaction leading to potential serious and or life-threatening reactions are possible due to the effects of etanavir on hepatic metabolism of certain drugs, and careful evaluation of drug-drug interactions is required prior to prescribing Paxivir. Here are some of the references I used to compile this presentation. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I have included my contact information here. Take care, everyone, and stay safe.